sometimes setting an objective is actually bad for you, especially if you're interested in innovation and creativity and exploration. The most interesting things you could possibly do are the ones that don't have an objective. It's just that they're also risky. If you're not willing to take risks, then don't do this and stay in the objective straitjacket because it's safer. But if you want to do something great, this is the only way. Meet Ken Stanley, professor in computer science. After working at OpenAI and Uber AI, he launched Maven, a new social network. Why we have so much toxicity in brand building and clickbait is because like that's what wins in this so-called meritocracy, but it's actually not as what is the highest value to the consumer. So you maximize the number of likes, you maximize the number of follows in order to get anything in front of anybody, which has led to all these perverse incentives. And I started to feel that something needs to be done about this. Welcome to another episode of Unlock Your Potential. Jeff Lerner, your host, always so glad to be back with you, having amazing conversations with amazing human beings. Today, we are joined by Kenneth Stanley, a uh, pretty incredible human being who's uh, done some amazing things, really interesting stuff. The more, I, the, the more I learn about him and the more I talk to him, the more intrigued I get. Uh, he used to be a professor in computer science at the University of Central Florida, uh, but he struck out into entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, founded a company called Geometric Intelligence, which sold to Uber, then worked at Uber for a while, um, actually ran the AI research for Uber, um, and then was a team leader at OpenAI, and has now uh, struck out yet again um, into a new program, a new company called Maven, which I'm excited to hear him talk about. Um, he's an inventor who has a number of credits uh, related to data and artificial intelligence and, and a bunch of stuff that is, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I'm looking at it and it's all above my pay grade, but it's uh, super smart stuff. And I'm really excited to talk to Kenneth, um, both at, at sort of a micro and a macro level. Macro, because I think that we all stand to gain by better understanding how these technologies work to make them uh, less intimidating and less um, subject to wild speculations. Um, but then also at a macro level of how these uh, these technologies really do impact, let's call the rest of us, the people that don't make a living in the technologies themselves. How does it impact us? You know, education, employment, healthcare, all all the big meta meta stuff that that we think about every day. So on that note, Kenneth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Yeah, so glad to have you. Uh, really, really excited about this conversation. Um, you know, our our show, we we kind of try to straddle between the subject matter and the human within the subject matter. So I always like to start with the human and and actually really understand you um and and how you how you got into your your field. And and in particular, I mean the, the premise behind Unlock Your Potential is like we're we're really trying to understand. Uh, the the sequence of of unlock mechanisms for people that really do go out and achieve outlier results and and sort of manifest their potential, which you've you know in your space you've done uh, really tremendous work and and done some incredible things and noteworthy things. So, talk to us a little bit about uh, the human Kenneth and and how he got to be who he is now. Uh, sure, yeah, happy happy to talk about being human. That sounds good. <laughs> um, I um, so yeah, I. I Basically, um, most of my career was artificial intelligence. I mean, that was what I was focusing on. But I, I think I got interested in that because uh, uh, when I was um, about um, eight or nine years old, my uh, my um, my parents enrolled me in this um, computer computer programming course at a at a day camp, um, and it was like during the period where normally you would play soccer. So I was a little disappointed at first, but I quickly just got really, really interested in the programming. I remember that, um, like all the other kids, like they, they would basically show us some lessons and then, then they would bring us to terminals. They were like TRS-80 computers from the eighties. And then they would, they would sit us down and, and give us code to try and, and all anybody else would do would play video games. Um, but I was like the only kid in the class who actually wanted to type in the code, um, and thought it was fun. Um, but I was really, quickly kind of interested in my interest shifted to, I just wanted the computer to be, to act like a person, basically. Uh, this is like at the age of eight or something like that. So I was really like a little kid, but I, but I just basically thought I could have a, have a conversation with me um, kind of like a person. 
And it was, it, I didn't realize that that's like this monumental challenge, like that, like no one has ever figured out. Like I thought, basically I thought there's some book or something that must tell you how to do this, but I just don't know exactly what to do. Um, but can that I was ask, the AI. Without yeah. trying to pinpoint your age, um, but can I ask how long ago that was that you were first interfacing with the stuff? Uh, yeah, let's see. I mean, it was around 40 years ago. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, yeah. Uh -oh. So early, early 80s, potentially. Early 80s. Yeah, early 80s. Yeah. So you were very yeah. early to this game, let's say. I was, yeah. Uh, well, um, I mean, the, 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 the field of AI goes back, you know, I feel like the 60s or even the 50s. So it, it's not necessarily, I wasn't, I'm not one of the early people in the AI field. Um, but I'm, you know, not a uh, newcomer, basically, at okay. this point. Okay. Um, and it's a pretty old field, actually. Um, I mean, at, at this point. Um, so uh, I was, um, yeah, so so basically I was very uh, attracted to an idea that basically was AI, but I didn't maybe use that word at the time. Um, but like getting the computer. But, but the thing that I think is really key to this is that the maybe two things about it is that I don't think I really am interested in computers. It's more that I was interested in people. It's just that it seemed to me that like I could really learn something about people with the computer. That I think that's really what was motivating me. Um, and I also really like surprise. So like I was, what I really wanted it to do was say things I wouldn't expect it to say. Like I could get it even at that age. I, I figured like I learned to program in basic and I, I, I got good enough. I could get it to like say things like, hey, what's your name? And I would say, Ken. And then it would say, hi, Ken. And that was kind of pleasing for her a little bit to get it to do that at all. But but then I was like, I just wanted to say things that I don't know it's going to say. And I didn't right. understand that part of it. Like, and just be interesting. And that, I think, maps to later things that were themes in my career. Um, but at the time, it was just interest I had as a little kid. Okay, so I'm curious uh, because one, one of the, well, actually, I... I I'll give you more context off the air. My audience knows all my context pretty well about why I ask the questions I ask, but I'm always really interested in like why the distinctions, especially early in life, early life distinctions, obviously the more time a distinction has to play out, the more dramatically it alters the trajectory of our life. So early stage distinctions are really fascinating to me. Like, mm. like if we could make it, if we could create a world and a child rearing experience and a paradigm of family and parenting and and you know whatever all the conditions were such that all kids were really interested in learning you know these these incredibly ultimately sophisticated and powerful things as opposed to just a small subset of kids who very often the way it plays out in school they end up almost getting demonized like they're they're picked on and they're bullied and like it, it it's like it's like hard to be into interesting stuff when you're young because we're so like lord, lord of the flies yeah. and you yeah, know yeah. athletically oriented and so i'm yeah. i'm always really interested why do you think you took to it like you did especially at a time when it wasn't actually even cool yet yeah yeah but this is a really interesting topic in its own right um i mean yeah why how to get kids to get into these kinds of things. Um, well, obviously I was predisposed in some way to being interested in this, uh, but why? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and why not the others? You know, same, right, same why question. Why didn't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I was wondering that. Well, why Why is everybody just want to play video games like when we could be entering code? Um, but it might just be that you know, people have different interests well, there could be two things. First of all, like I think we we should, in when we are teaching, especially kids, like we should spend more time explaining why things are interesting, not just how they work. I mean, because you go into that computer class. I mean, it's like a lot of little kids at a summer camp, but but they're there to like play. I mean, that's why they go to camp. They don't think of it as school. And then you're in a class suddenly with like here's like these boring lines of code and stuff like. Uh, I mean, it would be, you'd learn less, but you might get more into it if the teacher spent some time explaining why this is so fascinating. Maybe it would pick up a few more kids. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that I think people have different individual interests. And what really I think is probably important for kids is to encourage them to pursue their own individual interests. I mean, that that's something I don't think we do. Because what we do with kids is we basically tell them what to do. I mean, so now you're in 
you know, English class, you'll learn some English and that's what you're doing now. Um, and then you can go to math class and you'll learn this particular subject in math, which is the thing on the schedule for this part of the calendar. But there's no like just time to just like try stuff and see what happens um, with the things you want to try. Like, I mean, that's what was good about the classroom is I could just try stuff like everybody else is just screwing around. So I could just do whatever I want and I would enter in the code, but then I would twerk it and play around with it. Like I would change it and see what would happen. Um, and that was really the interesting part. So I could just do whatever I want. Um, but it was compatible with my interests. So I wouldn't expect every kid necessarily to be interested in this, but every kid yeah. interested in something. Well, that's yeah, and 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 it's a you know it's a it's a longer conversation. I suppose for a different time, but I I am constantly, uh, almost obsessively trying to solve for how to get people to love learning for its own sake, as opposed to uh, to love being entertained. Because like learn, there's a there's a grittiness to learning that like some of us find it entertaining in a sense. But it's a it's a lot more active and frankly uh, mm -hmm. intensive. Mm -hmm. it, it, whereas yeah. vi video games are really really interesting to me. And, and, and again, I'll just sort of say this, and we can move on. But like video games are so interesting to me because people talk about oh yeah, but the, you learn and you develop. Like they are they are valuable in that sense. Yeah, but you're learning for the primary purpose of advancing your entertainment. Like you're 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 willing to learn to unlock a new level of being entertained and a new level of being dopamine enriched and essentially jerked around by the video games agenda because but because it feels good you're willing to learn what it takes to get there as opposed to truly loving to learn. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I'll just say that. But it sounds like you were you were one that found themselves in that latter camp and that because you don't really do anything great in this world unless you're willing to stack skills and information and and experiences and abilities in a way that you'll never do if you don't truly love the process rather than just the result of the process so yeah, you yeah that's true. so anyway you love yeah, the I, process and that took you you where again I, I apologize for getting bogged down in my pontification about our educational process but <laughs> no no i i've thought a lot about education i mean i agree with a lot of what you're saying there um and uh you know i i do i mean i think kids are inclined to follow their curiosity more than adults in some sense like adults we lose it over time probably because of the educational system partly um but that's um that's a kind of intuitive inclination that i think should be encouraged and developed rather than stamped out which i think is what the education system does um because you have to understand that it's okay uh, to just do things because did, they're interesting did you have parents that were like inventive and and constantly learning? Like, did you see that model at home? Because I, I attribute a lot of it to the model of kids watching their parents, you know, sink into the couch for football all day on Sunday and like, oh, that's 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 being an adult. An adult is one who sits back and is entertained as opposed to actively learning. That's true. I mean, might, there might not be good examples. Um, did you, yeah, but like did you, did you have, yeah. did you have role models that were active learners? Um, To some extent, I mean, maybe it was, you know, my, my dad is a mathematician, um, and so he does research. So research is about like exploring things. Um, but, but I don't know, like, I, I wouldn't really see how he does. He just would be working, like he'd be in his office working. <laughs> so I'm not sure that really told me that much that I didn't really understand the nature of his work. Um, maybe, maybe there was in, um, so I'm not actually sure, uh, you know what exactly what what wasn't what is not the case is that there it wasn't like everybody just watched TV all day or something like that so that's true right. um so there's more kind of like talking there's a lot of talking I mean maybe that was part of like we would talk at dinner we'd talk a lot as a family it wasn't just um like passive types of activities it was like interacting maybe that's part of it but actually I'm not totally sure why um yeah there, there's not like a clear obvious like role model for just exploring and um, getting deep into something on your own. But but I do think that's essential to getting really good at something like self-motivated learning as opposed to prescriptive, like you have to do this type of learning um, leads to, it's not just that it leads you deeper, it leads to a different kind of understanding of subject matter when you discover it for yourself versus when somebody just spoon fed it to you. And you have a, a book that I, I apologize, I failed to mention in your intro, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. The, which I have not read, but I've looked at, I've actually downloaded it and, and with a plan to read it. But as I understand the sort of the, the 
the central thesis is is kind of what you're saying that this this unconstrained exploration of a thing is ultimately what leads you to a greater outcome than something that's like prescribed and linear. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah th- th- that's a way to say it. Um, yeah, and um, it, you know, it's, it's a big topic in my in my work. This this uh, why greatness cannot be planned, um, and the book yeah relates to what we've been discussing because it's about pursuing things without knowing where you're necessarily going or you're not trying to end up anywhere in particular. So that's what it means by it's not planned. So you don't have a specific objective, but you just set out anyway on some quest. It, um, how, much, how much in the book do you talk about education? Because what you just described is basically the opposite of our educational system. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole chapter in education. Um, so I, I definitely touch on education. I, I think a lot of the insights in the book relate to education. And and actually, by the way, the, the book itself is a consequence of a lot of research into AI, um, which led to a bunch of insights about what can be achieved without having an objective. Because in artificial intelligence, a lot of algorithms are start out with an objective. Um, and so we had discovered these really interesting phenomena that happen when there isn't an objective. And they were so interesting that I started to realize that they apply beyond AI to just um, the way that people run their lives and also the way institutions run, like like educational institutions. And so that led me to think this this general principle, which is it's strange that it derives from AI, that it applies to our culture and individual lives also would necessitate like writing a book because because otherwise there won't be a conversation about this topic. I just feel like I can't just publish in AI journals and have this be a broader conversation. And I wanted it to be a broader conversation. And then I realized that these are very, these principles are very applicable in education among many, many other things too. But education is super objectively driven, like in our culture across the world, so, actually. So let me give you a, a, a touch of context on my life, my work, and why I maybe approach this conversation the way I do. Um, I run a platform called Entre Institute, and it's basically an entrepreneurial education program for people that and it are are again we didn't plan it this way, but as it turned out, uh, our avatar, our our sort of archetypal customer is typically somewhere but at least thirty years old. Although we do get an, a fair, more and more young people because post pandemic, there's a lot more like existential. What is where am I going with my life now in younger ages? But but I would say in general, our model has been we are something people do as they approach or at least start to get an early sense of their midlife crisis. Like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I giving all my time to my employer and doing work I'm not passionate about? And I never see my kids and I'm, I can't pay my bills anyways and with inflation and ah, right. So people come like, oh, I would like to discover new ways to make money possibly a ways to make more money and have more freedom and flexibility. And I'm going to explore this modern digital digital version of entrepreneurship. And that's kind of who we are. And we meet them at that at that inflection point in their life. But the, the most persistent challenge that I have is that people want paint by number solutions. They want to know that, okay, so so in order to achieve my dream life, my my meta objective of this much in the bank and this much mm-hmm. time with my kids and whatever, mm-hmm. tell me everything I need to do. And I'm yeah. like, I'm, we we do our best to get to that p- prescriptive level because pe- that's you, you try to meet the customer where they are. But inside, I know, entre- literally the French word entrepreneur translates to the English word for adventurer. It's, this is, it's like, I'm, I'm actually going to steal your term. Greatness cannot be planned. Stop asking yeah. me for a paint by numbers prescription to have a great life. Paint by numbers, gets you an okay life. And that's why there's so many people yeah. coming to us going, my okay life, isn't that okay? And it's getting worse. I want a great life. Now, yeah. now apply the old model to the new, the new desire. And, and we have to try to like expand their mind to go, yeah, you're going through all these steps. You're checking all these boxes. You're going down the list, but at some point you're going to have to leap into the unknown and realize that this is self-directed and novel and different yeah. every time. So yeah, that's yeah. my context. Oh, I mean, sound yeah, sounds like I mean, you could you could you could put the book on your curriculum or something. They're, they're no, very I'm, aligned. I'm seriously thinking about it right now. I need to read it, but <laughs> okay, like yeah. that may happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I mean, it's it's you know, but the book is basically arguing about things that are ambitious. So like it it's very anti-objective. Like the subtitle of the book is the myth of the objective. So mm. it's it's but it's 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 important to highlight that that's about things that are ambitious. 
because modest objectives can work. So like there is a kind of paint by numbers to like how you're going to make lunch. You know, it's like you go to the refrigerator, you get the bread or whatever, like, you know what to do for that. I like for ambitious things like, oh, I want to be rich. Like that's ambitious or well, I want to, well, sorry. Well, well, well no, no, I, 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 you nailed it though. Cause I, I talk a lot about in, in my book, you know, back here, I, I talk about a lot about what I call the broken system and how the American dream has been fundamentally fractured. It, it's at this point, it's a broken promise. And it's this sort of collusion of these systems, almost like this meta system of systems that that tells young people, do all these things and you can have this life. And this life is basically a picture of upper middle class existence. It's not a billionaire owning an island. It's typically mm -hmm. a nice life in a nice safe town with a nice home, mm -hmm. a couple kids, you know, whatever, the, the quintessential American dream picture. But my my belief is that at this point, based on the the, the economic and social mm -hmm. realities that that young people are coming into, is that that picture is itself grandly ambitious. And that's actually what's changed is it used to be mm -hmm. reasonable to expect that outcome if you just kind of mm -hmm. did what you were told. Now it's this ambitious objective and, and all the data is coming mm -hmm. out saying people can't even afford to buy homes anymore. Like you have to mm -hmm. you even make $100,000 a year to afford the average starter home in this country now. Yeah, yeah. And so everything, yeah. everything that it does to me, everything that doesn't suck is kind of becoming ambitious. That is an interesting point. Yeah, and you know the thing about ambitious, the, the problem with ambitious objectives is that you don't know what the stepping stones are. You don't know what those things you have to cross through to get to them. So if, and that's why it doesn't make sense to set them as a typical objective and just ask for like a prescriptive, like, how do I go from A to B? Um, because we don't know what those are, which means that of course, like whatever you do that leads down that path, if you get there will entail risk. So, you know, because you have to take risks in order to explore, like if you're not willing to take risks, you have to do things that are safe. That means you do know what the stepping stones are. And that means you're not going anywhere that exciting. Um, but if you are going to go somewhere exciting, of course, there'll be some risk involved. And so basically what you're saying implies that, you know, there's risk involved in simply getting to like the upper middle class. And that's unfortunate as a social commentary, but it may or may not be true. I mean, if it's true, then um, then these principles will apply even to that, which is oh. kind of sad. Um, like you can't guarantee such a thing which a lot of people probably feel like is something that everybody should be able to achieve. But if you can't guarantee, then it's going to involve some risk and some level of self-discovery along the way, um, which will involve surprises. Well, so the, the, the median the median 65-year-old has $90,000 net worth at the age they're supposed uh, yeah. to retire. I mean, yeah, it is kinda, not... Yeah, it, it is broken. Well, that's true. That, that, that's true. Like that kind of stat just sounds horrible I, I don't i don't understand things like that um and um it does suggest that yeah just getting to a life of upper middle class is quite an achievement so and, and listen um, to this 12 years after graduating from harvard the average harvard alumni 12 years into their career makes eighty four thousand dollars a year and they're still paying off an average of almost three hundred thousand dollars in student debt a harvard alumni well okay yeah, that doesn't that doesn't sound good. That's surprising. Yeah. So even um, my point is even even the ostensible best path within the prescribed path still leads basically to a dead end for most people. Based on yeah, based on yeah. based on what 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 when you ask children, yeah. hey, what do you want yeah, your life to yeah. look like? It based on that as an out as a as a desired outcome, mm -hmm. I would say I would say we live in a world now where only the ambitious and risk tolerant should even bother having childhood aspirations. Right. Well, this is interesting. I mean, this, this conversation spans a lot of levels. So, I mean, there's a question of like, how do you go about these things, but also just like the social commentary of what that means for society. Um, but I mean, if that's the situation, I mean, I don't know the exact stats, uh, then, then it would imply that, um, yeah, there's going to be risk involved in having a very satisfying life. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you're going to have to, if you want that, take some risk. If you don't want risk, then then you need to like you know just take the best, modest path that you can, which will be a, a low risk path, but also lead to a modest end. 
Um, this is the choice, but I, I also think it's it's fine to choose that if you want to. Like you can choose whatever you want. I don't try to pressure someone to say you have to take risks. Like it's up to you whether you want to take risks. What I, I think is useful is just to understand what the options are and what their implications are. Um, so like yeah, there there's a more risk risk filled um, path, which is the one that will lead to more interesting things, or will lead to some setbacks that will be stressful <laughs> because that's what risk means. But it's not necessarily you'll you'll die or something, but it's like it could be stressful. Um, and so, you know, like it probably is a practical matter, makes sense to do some things to cushion yourself along the way. Because, I mean, the most extreme form of just like just doing what's interesting is to completely just ignore all risk and just do whatever you want. And, and that can be like too risky. I mean, like, like that's like a Steve Jobs, like drop out of college. You know, you may want to get the college degree because it is sort of a safety net, like to have that degree. Um and that's okay if that's if you don't want to take that much risk, but you still have to understand that like you know there's some trade off here. Like the more you follow a prescriptive path, like the less exciting things are going to be. So so let's re that actually feels like a good point to reconnect to the 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 discussion of both your your trajectory in AI and also the the learnings and the and the nature of AI itself. Um, so maybe yeah, pick back up on the story on on that note. All right, let's see how can I connect. Okay, so coming out of childhood, then. Um, it goes to, uh, yeah. I, I basically stayed with the interest in AI for like forever. So that was interesting. I pretty much picked it up at about eight and then just stayed interested in it. And then I went to, uh, college and did, did AI at college in computer science major. And then I went to grad school and I got interested in, uh, neural networks. This was the area that I got really interested in when I went to grad school for a PhD. And um, what I really can was you, interested in- Can you explain is, explain neural networks for the audience quickly? Yeah, ne neural networks are these um, artificial structures in the computer that you can program. Like you call them data structures maybe, or maybe call it a kind of algorithm uh, that are roughly modeled on how networks of neurons um, send signals to each other in a brain like our brain. So they're like roughly modeled on how brain brains work. And of course, like many people will just like come in and, you know, want to immediately say, oh, but they're nothing like brains. It's just completely horrible, but it doesn't really matter. It was roughly motivated. It's not exactly like a brain, um, but they're interesting things um, and they have interesting properties. So they have some brain like aspects and you can learn with them, which is what's really cool. So they can learn um, and learning is really interesting. Um, and so they can learn very complex, um, highly structured representations, which is evident in like today's like cutting edge stuff. Like they're, they're based on neural networks, um, like GPT mm -hmm. or something like that, or chat GPT. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are those and, and that, that motivate, that seemed like the most it, like, it, like a human ish thing that was around back when I started grad school. Cause a lot of AI to me seemed very kind of made up and foreign to my intuitive sense of how a human actually thinks. Like there's all kinds of other methods, like symbolic methods and logic based methods, statistical based, and they just didn't really resonate with me. So, so neural networks just seemed like the thing to me. It wasn't popular at the time, actually, when I, when I got into it, but yeah, I got into neural networks and I also got into evolution it was my other thing that I really got interested in or artificial evolution, like in a computer. Um, and I was interested in these things. Because what really interested in me, which is kind of individual to me, not necessarily like a, a field-wide type of thing, but I was just interested in how complex things come out of nothing. Because when I thought about AI, like this question always comes up, like how are we going to get to AGI, you could call it. Like people these days say AGI, artificial general intelligence. And there are a lot of different beliefs about this going back many years. Um, and most of them have to do with the idea that we'll, we'll build it, like we'll build it by hand kind of like reverse engineer the brain, not necessarily like by just doing neuroscience, but maybe by some kind of like analytic understanding or something like here's how it must work. And then we'll just like turn it into a program and make the computer work the way we think in our head. And I just was not, I never thought that super compelling because I always was skeptical that, that we can actually reverse engineer something that has like a hundred trillion parts, or actually a hundred trillion connections in the brain. So actually that's an, that's a low balling it. That's just the number of connections. But I always felt like it would be more interesting to understand what kind of process produces a brain, you know, because brains came out of something. They were created, mm -hmm. but not through an engineering process. They were created through a natural evolutionary process. Um, 
And I just thought, like, if I can understand how that natural evolutionary process works, not from the biology textbook perspective, but from some abstract perspective, like how do processes like that work? Maybe we could create a process that would cause brain-like structures to grow in the computer, to evolve on their own. And then we don't have to be the ones to design it because it seems to me it's easier to understand evolution than it is to understand how a brain works. Um, and mm -hmm. by the way, it's not easy to understand evolution either. A lot of people think, well, evolution is just a simple idea, but it's not. It's a very complex and hard to understand. Well, it's still more simple than like how a brain works. So, so I thought maybe I, we could evolve brains. So I got to ask, are you familiar with a, a gentleman named Ian McGilchrist? He wrote a he wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary, and he it's uh so the master is the right brain, his emissary is the left brain, and it's a it's an entire uh, very dense, very um, philosophical, but also psychiatrically grounded. He's a he's an actual um, I believe a medical doctor. I actually had him on the show. Uh, it's been probably a year or more, but it's all about brain hemispherality. And this mm -hmm. juxtaposition of how the left brain operates and how the right brain operates. And a lot of it is social commentary on how we're becoming more and more a society that resembles left brain function versus right brain function. But I ask it because it's, it's, it, it, it I know a lot, I've actually talked to a surprising number of people who have read and really enjoyed that book who, who don't have anything to do with brain science because it, because of what it tells us about ourselves. And that ultimately you have this more abstract, more creative, I would say greater and less planable mm. output system called the right brain to, to, yeah. to reference yeah. your themes. And then you have the left, the left brain, which is more subordinate, more militaristic and regimented and, and target oriented. Mm. And it's, it, it is much more linear in its processes. Mm -hmm. And that as a society, we're starting to let our left brains run the show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm curious if any of that, yeah. that, that idea of, of the difference between how you have this more like abstract network that's subordinated by a more like focused and logical network, if any of that exists inside the the, the neural network concept of AI. Mm -hmm. Well, it is certainly uh, that distinction is is very related to our book because the the book is kind of about the the creative aspect being unleashed and the fact that we've subordinated it. Um, like that's mm -hmm. true. Like you could think, cause like the, the, the fact that society is totally, uh, awash in objectives, um, it everything means that like, yeah, like the, that part of the brain has basically taken over, gotten all the credibility and we're now afraid of allowing the other part of the brain to do anything. Um, and so I, I, you know, sympathetic to that, um, critique and, um, it's, so, it, it, but is it is it evident in neural networks? So, what I would say is that, you know, in artificial intelligence, most things are very objective too. So, you could th there's a reflection of this kind of pervading view that like everything should be subordinated to an objective viewpoint um, in artificial intelligence as a field. It reflects society. Like most of the algorithms are objectively driven. So, like when people would uh, use neural networks, they would train them with an objective like sometimes you'd even use the word objective function um but you know basically they would say we would, we would follow a gradient to the objective um sometimes you call it a loss function but it's all just jargon it doesn't really matter what you call it basically you would set an objective and you try to get the neural network to achieve the objective so it's very objective in its view um and so this is not necessarily intrinsic to neural networks it's just how they're used because i think we uh, culturally are so uh, com completely um, consumed with this idea of everything has to be driven by where you're going, that it's just like obvious and so like obvious, like in quotes to everybody that that must be how intelligence should be driven. Um, and so that's what most algorithms do. And I, I tried to go in a different route, you know, because I was really interested in the opposite kind of algorithm, um, which is where my kind of evolutionary thinking went which is just the observation that, you know, evolution, which produced brains is a divergent process. It's not going to a particular point. It's not like humans are the objective. And then it started at a single cell and it just converged into this objective. It was the exact opposite. It started at a single cell, but it diverged into innumerable crazy things like photosynthesis, the flight of birds, 
human intelligence is just one tiny thing in that giant odyssey. Um, all in one single, you could call it a run if this was like an algorithm. It's just one run. Um, and people are like that too. You know, if you look at humans over the course of history, the, the history of civilization is divergent, not convergent. It's not like we all said we're going to build a time machine and now we're all working towards that goal or something like that. We just proliferate inventions divergently. So everything that's discovered becomes a stepping stone for more things to be discovered. And so you have this branching tree that actually is expanding, not contracting. But the algorithms and the way we run things is the opposite. We tend to run algorithms by converging to a point, which is where we want to go. We run institutions and society saying this is where we want to go as a society or as an institution. We try to converge to that point. This knocks out all the stepping stones that could have led somewhere else. Um, and this is where the, the algorithmic insights that came from my career started to intersect with this kind of like social critique um, because they, they both basically speak to the same issue is that this like a uh, complete prevalence of just like trying to converge into one thing um, is knocking out our ability to explore and collect stepping stones that can lead to discoveries and so forth, which entails risk, but is also what the human brain is best at doing. Like this is really our greatest talent is actually exploration. It's not solving one objective. It's the idea of being creative. Like that's what's amazing about it. Like if you go to like large language models and stuff, that's the thing they lack the most. It's the advantage we still have, you know, because like there could be a hard problem. Like you try to multiply two five digit numbers in your head and a computer will do better than you. But computers will not advance civilization on their own. Like civilization is the invention of everything over all our history, all the technologies, all the art all of the social ideas, like the political ideas, like they're all civilization. And it's a, it's a process of invention that unfolds over centuries. There is no technology that can do that right now. And it's an exploratory process. This is not a convergent objective process. We don't know so, where we're going. So the, the metaphor that is, I'm sorry, it's not really a metaphor. It's actually a, a practical illustration. Um, that's used in the book, in that book I referenced to differentiate between the left brain function and the right brain function is that that essentially uh, evolutionary, you know, biological survival and adaptation requires two things simultaneously. One is we have to be able to focus on, let's say, like we'll use a bird, right? A bird has to be able to focus on a seed so that it can fly to the seed and eat the seed. It has to, so it has to have this like myopic, let's, this is the left brain, narrow focus on that's highly objective oriented, right? But at the same time, it has to not get eaten because something else could be focused on it. So the right brain is sort of the 360 degree environmental awareness that keeps me, that creates the context in which I can focus on the objective without getting, you know, myself becoming victim to somebody else's objective or something else's mm -hmm. objective. And so that that's sort of the the basic premise of why the two hemispheres evolved. But it seems like we can ex sort of extract that to to these models that you're talking about. And and I'm immediately coming up with this concern in in what you're describing that like if and 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 this is intrinsic to science, uh, you know, scientific process. Everything is so objective or uh, objective oriented. Are we in? Are we actually creating networks and models? that actually really at best end up approximating left brain function. And I have done enough study on that to say that we would be a horribly dystopian and perhaps non-existent society if we were actually dominated solely by left brain thinking. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a risk um, that we are creating models that are, as you put it, left, left brain-ish. Yeah, they're, they're kind of left brain style. Um, and... Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's true that there's if if the entire world was left brain, it would be dystopian. But I think that it probably is more, at least within the field of AI, just means that it won't go that far unless we get some more right brain into it. Like I don't think left brain on its own is going to stay that exciting forever. You got to get the right brain in there, and um, you know, they'll they'll be. I think there's some degree of awareness that this needs to be addressed. Um, and so the people are thinking about it, like how, how to get uh, more creative capabilities into these systems. Um, but, you know, the truth is like right now, most critiques that you, that you hear about publicly are, are mostly about hallucination and stuff like that. So like you don't hear a lot of critique, like really strong on the lack of creativity, um, which just shows you where where the kind of focus is at. For So I, I think for, at the moment, 
like the, the great focus is at just getting to be accurate, to reason well, things like that. But that is different than being creative or being able to explore intuitively. Um, and so I do think it's getting somewhat short shrift. Um, but I expect that if you know, if people start to feel more satisfied with the, at least that the, that the other side of things are working, then they'll start to move more towards the creative side and start caring about that, uh, at least with an AI. Is there, I want to, I want to talk about your latest venture because it's really fascinating to me, uh, okay. what I've heard about it. But I guess what I would ask is, is there anything between where we left off and what you're doing now that's important to give yeah. context to what you're doing now and yeah. why you're doing it? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me, let me give a little context or a, um, a kind of like a fill in between like where we left off and, and why am I now built working on something that is really uh, un you wouldn't expect me to do, um, which is a new kind of a social network actually. So why would I do that? Um, and what I wanted to to just mention to to make to make sense of that is that um, what happened to me is really weird and unusual like for an ai researcher because generally ai researcher just to be doing AI research for their whole life i mean it's it's a very fun type of thing to be involved in and it's intellectually stimulating and so certainly could take a whole life um but the thing is like what kind of diverted me a bit i mean i know i still kept up with the ai research but i got diverted part of my life went in a different direction because of writing this book why greatness cannot be planned because you see, the book was trying to say these principles that are emerging, at least in my case, from AI research, that suggest that sometimes setting an objective is actually bad for you, especially if you're interested in innovation and creativity and exploration. So it's saying that, that that actually applies outside of the field of AI to your individual life and also to institutions. Because I think a lot of institutions like educational institutions, but also like scientific research as an institution, yeah. like funding agencies, grant funding agencies, National Science Foundation, they are very objectively driven. And I wanted to make this point from an algorithmic basis because it sounds like new age philosophy is the problem. Like I think other people have argued things like this before, but I thought what could make this very concrete is that this is being motivated not from a philosophical perspective, but from an algorithmic perspective, which is much harder to argue against, you know, because we've got mm. experiments and evidence that like, this is how the world works. You can't get away from the fact that this is a problem. And so that then helps to motivate the argument in the book, which is really like across everything, personal lives and professional lives and institutional and everything, government. And so... What happened then was that was actually eight and a half years ago that that book came out. And so then this weird thing happened to me, which is that I I did succeed, or my, me and, and my co-author, Joel Lehman, we succeeded in, in getting more than just AI research to look at this issue. So what happened, some people start coming to me from other walks of life that are not AI researchers. And this is actually weird. Like the whole thing is really weird because I've never heard of an instance like this before where something from AI goes outside of AI to some other thing, um, like social critique, and then starts to turn into like its own kind of conversation. Like I haven't heard of this, but because that happened, it started to... Oh, and by the way, I should just note that it should work that way though. If you think about it, if we're researching intelligence, like the most salient aspect of what it means to be human, it should be the case that like dribbles of insights about ourselves pop out of it. Like if that didn't happen, something would be wrong, I feel like. Like this is kind of why I, why I was interested in AI. I thought I would start understanding some things about humanity. And this was one thing is like that setting objectives everywhere is actually bad for us. And so in talking to people about this for years, like years and years, and it just like something started to sink into me. And I mean, I talked to groups of artists. I talked to groups of doctors. I talked to retirement counselors. I talked to kids. I talked to like everything you can imagine, like huge diversity, the military, like all over the place, because everybody's wondering, what does it mean if we shouldn't be setting objectives? And so this concept started to sink into me that everybody hates the way everything works. It like it it sank into me more than anybody, I imagine, because most people haven't spent like eight and a half years talking about this. Um and it, at like an intimate level one on one. And so like I started to feel, you know, people are saying there's this objective straitjacket around my entire life. Like if I want to do something because it's interesting and I tell my my manager or something, like there's no way they would let me do that. They would say, what's the bottom line impact? What's your objective? How is this going to help the company? You can't just do things because they're interesting. Even if you apply to get research funding, like they want to know what the objective is. What's the deliverable? You can't just explore because you think that's an interesting path. Intuitively, you can't even talk about your intuitions. Um, and so, you know, like the world is just arranged around objectives strictly and dogmatically everywhere. 
And so I got this feeling like everybody wants out of it, including the people. The weird thing, the ironic thing is this includes the gatekeepers. You know, you think the one class of people who like love the system are the people who run the system. It's their fault in some sense. But actually, they're not. None of them seem to want to be like stand by how things work. I didn't meet almost any, but no one almost. In my, in t- I expected there would be like people on the other side. But if you get to somebody one on one, they're just like, I would like to change things, even though I run things. But I also answer to people and they have objectives. Like, you know, like the people I've I met people running like labs that have like a, a billion dollars almost in funding. And, and they would say, um, you know, I, I'd like to change things and make things work more the way your book says, but we answer to Congress. Like Congress wants to know bottom line. Like, I don't know if I can take these kind of risks. And so like everybody feels like they can't take any risk, even though everybody agrees, um, which is a really crazy situation. And I started to feel that something needs to be done about this. And, and like, and then it just occurred to me, the crazy idea, I, maybe I could actually do something about this. So but what could I do? I was thinking like, what could I do like a year and a half ago? And I was still at OpenAI at that time. Um, and it seemed to me that, um, at first, it's like I could talk to people, but that's all I've been doing. I don't want to just talk to people. So then I, I was thinking, wait a second. Like, let's go back to, to, the, to the first principles here. All of these ideas come from algorithms. They all come from algorithms. They're not like philosophical ideas, like I said. Like, I wasn't thinking about how the world should work. I was just doing AI research. But if it came from algorithms, then I should be able to bring it back to algorithms. I should be able to create a system that works algorithmically the way open-ended algorithms work, which are the kinds of algorithms that don't work objectively, which is what I spent my career looking at, these kinds of open-ended algorithms they're called, and put in a system like that around people so they live in an open-ended system instead of in this very objectively driven system. And then I thought, well, what is what kind of system is that? It's some kind of network where people would be inside of it and it works and it, like it has a different set of incentives than we're used to. And then it occurred to me, well, that just ha- that's this kind of social network. As, as soon as you put people in a network, it's a social network. And they're having ideas are moving back and forth through the network. And so I thought that, oh, that is really interesting. Like we, we could have like a serendipity network, like something that works algorithmically the way these open-ended algorithms work, but with real people inside of it. Um, and so that was the basis of what I ended up actually doing, uh, like creating this company, Maven, which would create a serendipity-based network. And just one last quick thing I wanted to say about it is it is it is not something that I came to because I was trying to create a new kind of social network. As you could see, it, the trajectory of thought was through other things entirely. But as soon as I realized that we'd be doing this, it was obvious that it's interesting to contrast this with regular social networks, you know, the ones you're familiar with. Um, and the thing about social networks is they reflect the objective, the objective philosophy that pervades society as well. Like they're very objective, like likes and follows is an extremely objective and extremely maximization based system. Like everything is based up based on maximizing something. So you maximize the number of likes or you maximize the number of follows in order to get anything in front of anybody, which means that the objective is to maximize those concepts, which has led to all these perverse incentives, which reflect a lot of the straitjacket feeling that people have elsewhere. But now it's in this world of social media that you have all of this. And it leads to all these like really nasty unintended consequences, like the clickbait and the echo chambers and the disinformation and the toxicity. Like it's all related to the fact that we have an objective incentive system, which is all about, I have to somehow win a daily Darwinian competition, like to get anything stated out there, um, which is basically it's convergent. Like that's what objectives do. They converge thinking. You know, because if you have an objective, you have to throw away things that are not on that path. And so everything that's on the path is what's kept. We see that as a phenomenon in social media. Like it's very converted because it's driven by maximization. And so like there's a huge diversity of thought, which is like thrown out the window that would be interesting and serendipitous to you, but you'll never see it. And so I realized that this alternative that we wanted to build is actually uh, like a real interesting counterpoint like to the way everything works that everybody's complaining about so that's like another reason maybe to do this and so that's what we decided to to go ahead and do and create this thing called maven hey there real quick i just wanted to let you know i have been concentrating a lot lately on providing tons of value to my text message community this could be random thoughts this could be letting you be the first to know about an event i'm planning or a special i'm running or a free training i'm hosting Anyway, just shoot me a text to get subscribed. The number is 
996-3926. Thanks so much. Let's get back to the podcast. Yeah. So super interesting. Uh, I'll tell you the, the the concept that came to mind. And I think it's it's probably why I'm so wired in alignment with you f- philosophically um, is, is I- I'm making the distinction between jazz and basically every other type of music that isn't fundamentally a like multi-input improvisational swarm. <laughs> um, and I, I was a jazz musician. In, th- in my 20s, I was a professional yeah, jazz yeah, musician. Yeah, yeah. And, and like all the greatest musical moments of my life happened at a time where in, in, in a jazz context where you have, it's not it's not free form. And, and actually for the record, I don't like free form jazz. I don't like listening, just everybody doing whatever they want at the same time without regard, so to speak. Um, I like uh, jazz that still occurs within the, the basic constraints of tonal music systems within some discrete meter that even if the meter changes, there was a meter to change, so to speak. Um, and so I'm wondering, and, and that's those are all the most beautiful sort of transcendent mm-hmm. moments in my life where like in this like sonic cloud of something that was spontaneous and never to be seen again, it was all unplanned greatness. And so that's the lens that I'm looking at. I also know jazz is maybe the least popular form of music in popular culture because divergent non-objective oriented thought is we live in a world that has just gone the other way like hard veer hard left the other the other way i picked left because of the left brain but um so i'm i'm curious i got there's there's different ways i feel like we go the philosophical way or we could go like more of like the entrepreneurial way which is like analyze the the core value proposition of the social network how yeah. are, are you, are you, how have you solved for actually getting people who are now so indoctrinally objective focused to come participate in your experiment, which is to let go of that way of being? Yeah. Good question. Um, so yeah, if you go in there, you'll find it's really, truly a radical different type of social network because there are no likes and there are no follows. Um, so our, um, pitch is that you are going to follow interests instead of influencers. So people are following interests um, Mm -hmm. and it's about pursuing your interests. And when you follow your interests, then you are exposed to other people who are speaking about what is interesting to you, um, which is basically increasing your kind of surface area of exposure to ideas related to that interest. And what you'll find into like the, the way it attracts people or what I hope it will attract, how it will attract people, is that you will be exposed to things that are actually interesting to you that you won't see anywhere else because they wouldn't have won this objective competition. They're not interesting to everybody. They're interesting to you because you are idiosyncratic in the kinds of things that could be stepping stones to you or triggering to you, transformative to you. And the other thing is you can actually have a normal conversation. Like if you think about it, if the pressure to get a lot of people to see what you say is off, you can just have a normal conversation, like actually explore your interests instead of try to impress people at every step of the way in every moment in every conversation, because um, everything is going to get upvoted or downvoted or liked or not liked. Like that isn't happening here. So people are just having normal conversations about their intersections of interests. And so if you want to actually be able to explore like that, then this would be the, the platform that could allow you to do that. So this is this sounds like a pretty big social experiments uh on a on a that's perhaps uh, a not intentional to the design which i imagine like okay you have a clinic over here you have multiple clinics over here you have instagram clinic you have tiktok clinic which is the seediest of all and they're actually there's probably worse than that i don't know like what's worse than that i don't know but but anyway and they're all they're all selling you know methadone or like opioid derivatives and then over here you have this like free detox facility and like utopian place where you can go just be and every human will now have a choice do i actually yeah. want to get off the drip mm-hmm. and come over here and and be childlike again and not competing for like you said competing for for you know social reinforcement it'll be and, and i'm so i i i actually 
I, I'm not going to lie. There's a little bit, I'm having a little bit of a cynical flare up of like, people are just so addicted to being addicted now. Yeah. 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 Will they, will yeah, they, yeah. or, or will we only get the substrate of, <laughs> yeah, of, of yeah. humanity that is willing to come participate and you end up with yeah. this like elite group doing elite stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're totally right. It, it is a social experiment exactly in the respect that you say. I mean, it's almost unthinkable um, that we take away likes and follows, which is basically the dopamine addiction mechanism, you know? So, so like we're, we're taking away your, your, your crack or whatever it is like, like in saying, well, you still can enjoy life. I mean, maybe that's, that's, so you could, you could argue like, we just can't do that. That's where people are not prepared, but I don't know, because like, I think like what we've seen so far and we've, we've had like people coming in that we've invited in. Um, so we, we haven't like actually brought in a huge cohort yet, but if the, the people that we've let in, uh, they have, um, like there are people on there who've said that they feel way, way better, like inside of the system. We have lots of these kind of great quotes of like these like early users who are just like, like, I feel like so much less anxiety every time I use this than I used to feel in social media. And like, I actually like feel like I'm learning stuff and enjoying what I'm doing and people actually respond to me. Um, cause you know, like in the current system, like if you're not one of the 0.1% who has like a hundred thousand followers, like most stuff that you throw out into the abyss just goes nowhere. So it's mostly you're just there to listen to big name people making announcements. Um, well, and, and, so and I'll actually, I'll actually, I'll yeah. actually up that ante and say I have a hundred and nine thousand followers, but because of the way those followers came into my my following, which was through a small number of reels that went viral, like a year over a year ago, and people that that follow you off of one reel, they aren't engaged consumers of yeah. your product. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I, I, even with over a hundred thousand followers, I still make a post and, and I get like, you know, sometimes I'll get 400 likes, sometimes I'll get 37. And then right, I get right. commenters going, bro has a hundred thousand followers and only 40 likes. Clearly some loser who paid for, paid for yeah, fake yeah. followers. It's like the whole ecosystem is so yeah. effing toxic. No, I hope, so I hope true, you'll right? invite yeah. me to be a user right. of yours because I basically yeah. have gotten to where I hate social media. It's gross. Well, we're uh, you can. I mean, I it's this is a really interesting point because it's not just you. I mean, I, I mean, I've been looking at the distribution of likes and things on these systems, and and especially replies. It's like how many people reply is absolutely pathetic because it's true that you can have a hundred thousand followers, and they're not fake. But still, like you say something interesting, and like three people reply. Two of them are just kind of like trivial one-offs, just to like to get attention. So it's like the, the hundred thousand people were exposed. You're like you're one of the the winners. You're in the elite class, and you get like one piece of interaction out of that. Like that is just absolutely pathetic. Is that how the world has to work? You know. So that's actually one of the pitches that I think we have is that you 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 don't need followers. You don't need. We don't have a concept of followers. What you say will go to people who share your interests, and they'll see it. So you'll actually get these people, and the people can talk to each other like normal people. And so it's a, it's it's much more equitable, especially for the people who aren't in the elite, um, who like otherwise no one will ever see anything they have to say um, unless they're replying into something that somebody who had 100,000 uh, followers already started. Um, and so that's another side of it. I think it's just like if you want to get engagement, um, this is a place for people who don't have 100,000 followers that just come in right away. You can get connected to people who share your interests. So and it's, it's part based on the theory. You're not necessarily an idiot just because you don't have 100,000 followers. It's not like, oh, well, you know, you only have 500 followers. You, like no one should ever listen to you. You're an idiot. Like that's the implication. Like lots of people have interesting things to say that aren't famous. They talk to each other all the time. We talk to, to people that are interesting in lots of settings that aren't like famous online. Um, so it should be possible. And by the way, you mentioned like letting you in. I just wanted to point like anybody basically can come in at this point. Um, I haven't made a public announcement, but I'm about to. Um, and so probably by the time this show comes out, it'll be public. You could go to try.heymaven.com. Um, and you'd be able to just uh, find downloads and get into the app. Hey Maven, try dot hey Maven dot com. Yeah, try uh, t r y dot hey Maven yeah. is h y m a v e n dot com. Cool. All um, right, I'm gonna I'll, I'll let you in I, 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 shortly after the show. So I'll so for my audience, I will actually be posting thoughts on my my Maven experience I, again, if, if that's okay with you, that I share yeah, my sure. experience. Yeah, okay. uh, by all means, uh, yeah, please, please do. I'd be happy to. Yeah, it's so interesting because especially for a lot of this audience, we're a very entrepreneurial audience. Obviously, a lot of people find this show coming through Entra and and I'm sort of that's my what I'm known for in the world is entrepreneurial evangelism. And like yeah. so as marketers, as business owners, 
uh, I actually teach that the only way to be about social media that makes any sense, maybe this is my bias, is to be yeah. objective, objective oriented. Because otherwise, right. why the hell yeah. would I swim in a cesspool if I wasn't trying to get something very specific for that experience? Right, right, right. So yeah. I, I'm seeing, my, I'm seeing my life now potentially ending up bifurcated between a social network that's actually pleasing. Yeah. And a social network where I go to get exposure, build an audience, get, I don't care about likes, but I do care about customers yeah. and, and, you know, being influential yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, but man, this, okay. So I feel like we're set, by the way, I told yeah. you I had a hard stop. I looked at my calendar. I don't. So I, unless you have a hard okay. stop, we can keep talking for a little while. Oh. Sure. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep talking. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Really Cause I feel like, talking. I feel like we've set up this really interesting, like let's, let's, Let's project that your thing absolutely takes off. And there is this yeah. new space that people can go be in that is interest oriented mm -hmm. rather than influencer oriented. And I yeah. mean, that just sounds, it's a, merit, it's a meritocracy, a meritocratic marketplace of ideas and discourse. I love it. Mm -hmm. That sounds incredible. And so if it kind of almost reminds me of, uh, have you ever read Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand? I know I've heard of it, of course, but I haven't okay. yeah, yeah. So in Atlas Shrugged, all the entrepreneurs, all the free thinkers, all the creatives, all the people that aren't uh, totally enrolled in the sort of left brain he hege hegemonical like construct that has right, become right. the 20th century world, they all leave. Yeah. They go to Colorado and they create their own their own culture. And it's amazing yeah. because it's like what you're describing. And then everybody that's left yeah. is like the bureaucrats and the 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 lifer red tapers and and the people that are just totally hooked up <laughs> yeah, to the machine drip. and that yeah, society yeah. is just is just yeah. <laughs> so I I, I wonder that's if it. I mean yeah. that's like this experiment here maybe that'll happen yeah, that that's true there's an analogy there that would be a good narrative for this so experiment. that would make that I mean, would it, make you John Galt by the way if anybody that catches the reference uh, Kenneth is John Galt in this this metaphor okay okay yeah I so yeah I mean I, I the the narrative, like, yeah, the, this kind of like, oh, there will be a, a set of people who actually like go take a pilgrimage to a different way. Um, and there are people who want to explore um, for its own sake, which is, you know, like you said, is it going to be like everybody or is it going to be there's this subset, the minority, like significant minority that, that like just most people do like just being in this objective, addictive situation and there'll be the small pioneering subset. I don't know what it'll be. I, I hope it's like more than just that small thing, but it might be that at first. I hope that maybe the, the small pioneering subset that are willing to try something like this could then form a basis. Then other people could come in and see this actually is cool. Like you would actually like to be in a world like that. Well, um, and and so, you know, I, I think like it's interesting what you said about the, like, you know, you, you got to be there. Like this is how you've been taught, how you teach about like for entrepreneurs to think about social networks. Because I've seen that in, like, I've, of course, getting into this, I've got a lot of advice from people in social networking moving into that field. And it, it's like, yeah, there's a real kind of like, um, there's 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 a there's a very kind of uh, pervasive dogma about social networking, about like, uh, what, what does it mean to be a social, a successful social network? And what does it mean to be a successful person in a social network? And there's all these assumptions that are completely unquestioned. It's like, basically, everybody is a brand. That's like this like fundamental thing. Which is kind of nasty, actually. It's kind of sleazy that everybody's a brand. But it's kind of true. It's like if you want attention, you have to think of yourself as a brand. It's you don't have to literally call like I'm a brand, but you have you're forced in some sense to think like a brand. Yeah. If you want to, for the record, we teach we teach that personal branding in most forms of modern day entrepreneurship is the critical cluster of skills for people to have yeah. longevity and sustainability in their entrepreneurial endeavor. So. I'm I'm perhaps a purveyor of the sleaze because okay. I'm the same person. You said, I, by the way, I, the most quotable thing I've heard so far is, "Everybody hates how everything runs." That was so good, <laughs> and I'm well, I'm true. in I'm yeah. in that I'm in that I'm in that group. I I hate the reality yeah. of what it is, but I also don't want to go get a job and sit in a cubicle all day. So I have to be thinking about my personal brand all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and and I and I think. There's probably room in the world for both. Like, like I, I think of like you know current social network as kind of an announcement service. Is really when it's and it's sort of at its best. It's like if you want to get the word out like about something important, like this is a place you can announce it and people will find out about it. it some some of these things are perfectly innocent and, and like you know reasonable things to announce. It's just not like they're all sleaze. Um, there there are good reasons to be announcing things or to connect to your users or whatever it is. 
And that's fine. That this conserves their purpose. I don't think our network would be good for that. It's not good for that because, like, every shot you take, you're going to hit new people. Like, it's not like going to be the same group. Um, so this is a, for exploring curiosity. Actually, having a conversation about something that interests you, like maybe something you're not totally sure about. Like something people have said to me about, uh, like, current social networking is that they feel comfortable talking on brand, like what they're known for, but they're very uncomfortable with talking about anything they're not known for. Because it's like, that's not what their followers are there for. They're not there to hear yeah. that kind of stuff, that kind of, a, or you might feel embarrassed, like maybe I'm stupid on this, even though I'm smart on the other stuff. But, so where can you go to talk about anything like that? Um, and it's like way easier, like on, on our network to just, you don't have to worry. You don't have followers. You're not going to lose followers. There's no following to begin with. You're not in a competition. Um, and so it's uh, it's just a radical experiment, like in a different kind of way. So but I, you know, I, I yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So it's almost like each. This is interesting, man, because I'm I'm in that I'm in that group, right? Like I'm a jazz musician. I'm a philo I, I love philosophy. I love uh, some of the higher arts. Like I like to go see plays, and you know, I like poetry. Um, but also, I'm an entrepreneurial influencer, CEO, founder, business guy. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm trying to ultimately, I am, I'm, I'm actually faith-based too. I have like, you know, spiritual proclivities and fundamentally, I want to say, I feel like you and I are actually in, in a two sides of the same business. I'm trying, and I don't want to, I shouldn't be assumptive in, in saying that, but like what I'm really interested in is an awakening. Like the reason I'm challenging the traditional employment model, the the 40, 40, 40 years, 40 hours a week to get to, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the proverbial rainbow, that doesn't work anymore. The whole the whole thing is broken. And to to instead come over, embrace the entrepreneurial life, which is yeah. you know, the biggest challenge I have is that it's harder to define what that is because it's kind of like everything that isn't linear. It's all the unplanned, is what I'm trying to get people yeah. awake to yeah. to awake yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. and you're, you're, I feel like we're kind of trying to do the same thing in a, in a lot of ways. So what's cool about yours yeah. is like, for me, I am enslaved in a sense in traditional social media to my agreed upon my, my contractually agreed upon notion of self via contract with my audience. And then I have to, you like, to your point, I have to constantly converge my ideas into that box to the extent that I want to effectively use the social media tool because that's the way it's designed. Yeah. But I I that makes me crazy because this the the best things I want to post, I often end up not even posting. Whereas yeah. in your world, every idea you have becomes its own equally weighted participant in your ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you can explore. I mean, it's, it's an exploratory process rather than like a promotional process. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a question like, you know, how many people just will want to have that in their life? But I think if you experience it, you'll you'll see why, you know, it, it's easier to see why you might want it. But but the, the, so, the trouble will be to explain that. So um, algorithmically, algorithmically, have you decoupled the post from the poster? Because like, uh, uh, let me, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, that that's an interesting question. So, um, the you, well, I mean, so the al algorithmically, actually, there is an algorithm behind things. Um, just as like all these social networks have some kind of algorithmic aspect to them, um, but it's informed by. It's worth noting, at least, it's informed by these algorithms in open endedness, which is a subfield of machine learning, where it's very active in. Um, where algorithms have been developed that are not objective, but that are rather meant to generate interesting diversity or actually there's a whole subfield called quality diversity algorithms or qd is what we call it like these quality diversity algorithms like you run an algorithm you don't get a solution to a problem you get like a ton of different ways of doing things all in one run and so it's a little reminiscent of like biological evolution where like it was one run and it produced all these different species and so we've taken this qd which is this quality diversity type of view and we put it as the algorithm around this system, which is like never been th done before. Like these other mm. systems are very objective, like other social media. And so we've taken this fairly esoteric side of machine learning. It's not the the topic everybody's talking about. Like it's like it's not chat GPT, it's a QD. Although we have language models inside the system too, which are doing interesting this matching. But we put this QD algorithm. So we, 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 are, we are informed by um, an understanding algorithmically of how you can foster 
divergent creative and interesting stuff. Because there is an idea that within a diverging system, you cannot have everything. Like that's an important aspect of evolution too. Like some lineages die off. They die off so we don't end up seeing every bad idea that ever occurred. By the way, I don't think necessarily things that died off are always bad. I don't mean to say that. But we can't, we just don't have the resources to support everything that you might say. So, so our system is designed to allow you to see all this diversity and have high quality, but not be a maximization-based system. So it's not trying to get like the, the guy with a million likes will just kill everybody else. And then everything else is like way down in terms of viewership. And so that is something that we've taken away. Um, and so there is a lot of algorithmic thought that goes into how to create a system like this, but we're the right people to do it because that was our field, quality, diversity, and open-endedness. But in terms of decoupling people from posts, so one thing is that I just want to be clear, like when you say decouple, it doesn't mean that your name is not on the post. People's names are still connected to the post. Sure. But there is a decoupling in, in the sense I think you mean, which is that the post's promotion, its, a, it's ability to be seen by lots of people is totally independent of who posted it. So that yes. decoupling does exist. Yeah, it has nothing to do with that. Um, so that is that is very interesting. Yeah, it's a completely different way of thinking about things. So it's I think it's really interesting the 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 way our the way our conversation in a very unplanned fashion has circled back to I would argue a a little a little node of greatness in in the sense of closing a loop uh, in a, in a serendipitously cool way. Early in the conversation, I referenced when we were talking about education and why you were into coding and other people weren't. Um, I referenced Lord of the Flies, and it, you know, to try to explain some like child development realities in in context of education. I actually think that, to a large degree, is what this is this experiment is about. Is you know, ultimately, social media platforms are designed to pander to at least some portion of our nature. They work the way we work or else they wouldn't work. And there is a part of us that actually not only acquiesce, but I think we 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 desire to just have that every time The Rock posts his opinion about anything, it has 3 million likes because he's The right. Rock. Right. And, we, and we want these iconically popular people to come show us who to be and how to be. And the trade-off for that is that our post uh, about something that we might actually know a lot more than The Rock about is never going to compete with his, right? And in your world, it would. Yeah. So the question, yeah. really, the, yeah. the, the philosophical, the, the uh, almost like ontological question at the base of your platform is, are people okay living in an in or being in an environment that's untethered from our most primitive survival systems, which is like... I want to find the most powerful person and align with them because if if something bad happens, they'll keep me safe. Yeah. yeah. So well, it'll, it'll, yeah, it, yeah. so you could you could be setting up like really meaningful social evolution. It'll be fascinating to see who's into it. Yeah. It's it's it is fascinating. Um, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's a total different value proposition. But you know, one interesting there are interesting precedents for life before likes and follows. You know, because it, it's true that like. You know, you kind of think of them as almost laws of nature at this point. Like the way you describe it, it's like this is just compatible with life itself. Like, you know, you right. have to have those, you have to have these popular figures and, and you need to follow those figures. And like, this is like what we want as people. But there was stuff before all this, you know, like the old timers remember Usenet. Um, and there are bulletin boards like PH, the PHP, BB, like primitive bulletin board services from the 1990s, which still exist, by the way, today. Like nobody talks about this, but they still exist. And those have some of the millions of users um, and were perfectly uh, fine. Like everybody, the people on them were enjoying it. You know, like the old timers on Usenet would say that was one of the, the, the golden ages of social media it was before all this crap happened. Um, now, there are different interpretations of why. Like I've heard some people say it's because all, all the smart people were online and then later the idiots joined. Um, that's a different interpretation. But I don't necessarily think that's that's true. I think it shows that you can live in a world that doesn't work that way. It's more that what was discovered was that there are mechanisms that are extremely powerful on the human psyche or human nature, um, which are maybe more powerful than the people who designed them even expected. You know, because I don't mm -hmm. necessarily have the cynical view that like Mark Zuckerberg was thinking, how are we going to manipulate people and like make them our slaves? Or I mean, it was, I don't think he probably was just trying to make a system that was really engaging. 
Um, but as a side effect of that, I think you get these things that are unbelievably powerful, like likes and follows um, and psychologically powerful. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other things that can be very satisfying. Um, you know, they have existed historically and, and still do. There are still these PHPBB boards. Um, there are still ones that are thriving today that don't use this kind of a system. Um, so it shows that I think there there are people responding to a world where I think the thing is that they can be heard. Is like kind of like, why would you go on some primitive bulletin board service? Because probably people will see what you have to say. I mean, like on, you right. know, go on X or something, it's like, you have 10 followers and you haven't put in the time. It's like, why even bother saying anything? It's like, no one's going to see it anyway. Um, well, this is like places where you can be heard. You're in a community that listens to you. Um, and people are kind of like not having to be famous to be heard there. So it's like culturally acceptable. Um, and so these things can exist. Um, and it's just like, can that exist at a mass scale? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be, it's an interesting social experiment and worth, I mean, I hope that like the result would be that we just have options. We'll have a society where you can have an exploratory side of social media, which is like that, which is more pure. Um, and then you have another announcement centered, uh, dopamine hit centered one, which can still exist, coexist. It doesn't have to be dismantled, but it can coexist. But we just deserve the other option, is what I think. So As human beings, if, if we else. have the other option, we may be veering into into other other waters here that are outside either of our formal purviews, but if we have the other option, because like whenever I talk about social media, especially, and, and I talk to a lot of young people, I have four kids, uh, two that are teenagers, one that recently was a teenager, and one that's not yet a teenager. But but still, I'm I'm sort I'm I'm around young people a lot, and I I talk yeah. to them about social media, and there's sort of this like this sort of you know resignation of like, well, if you want the good, you have to tolerate the bad, right? And the good is like, you know some interesting conversations and most of it, especially for young people's are out staying connected to friends um, in a lot of ways. But I wonder, like, it sounds like what you're creating could start to fill the space of, of what that, which is good about social media. It's sparking new connections, new ideas, interesting conversations, information that you might not otherwise be exposed yeah. to that is relevant to your interests and so forth. But leaving out the bad, which is the the human, you know, jockeying for popularity dynamic and all its yeah, its yeah. various uh, yeah, tentacles. Yeah. What, like, yeah. if we can, if we can, if we can isolate the good into your world, what would be the argument for keeping the old? Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's it's a hard question for me to answer because obviously I'm fine with the like taking over the social media world, but but I think that like realistically, I think. Um that there is there is a um a practical purpose being served um by uh uh but by these like traditional platforms in it, like but it has all these really bad side effects so that's the problem is that there's it's not like it's all bad that's the thing i mean i recognize that like i, I don't necessarily want to knock out all these networks like I, that's not really my goal here but i recognize that there's still something good about it which is this announcement ish aspect like i like all this other stuff like you know like like the the toxicity brand building like clickbait it's just all nasty and like really like displeasing and it definitely bad for young people like there's no question this is having an effect and it's probably bad for old people too like a lot of anxiety comes out i mean just go through my ex feed i feel anxiety after a while um but the thing is that um being able to to get the latest from uh, somebody who you want to know what they're up to it's like that's still useful at some level yeah like despite all those toxic and bad things that come out of this it's like just useful and like our service doesn't i don't think we don't address that like you know if you do represent some like say you're one of the leaders in the field of ai um and people want to know what you're thinking like you wouldn't go to our service to get that information um so so where can you go well those services are available um, right of course like then there's all these other bad things that come with it um and so i mean that might be another niche that doesn't exist just a place where you can announce stuff without that but i don't know how to set that up um without like all the side effects that are really right. nasty um but like this kind of announcement service it's just a utilitarian thing it's it's useful on both ends it's useful for the people receiving it and the people sending it like i personally find it useful to be able to go to x and just tell everybody what I'm what I'm thinking you're doing. Um, and that's just useful. But that's like, you know, within a very narrow band of expertise, right? Because like I have things I'm curious about that I'll never post on X. Just like you said, there's things you don't post because you're like, 
you know, like, I don't know if I'm really comfortable like sharing this with all these people who like expect something from me. Right. And like, they, they do, I, I don't really know about this that well, this, this isn't on brand at all. I mean, I don't like thinking about myself as a brand, but I know some things are not a brand, you know, but they're still interesting to me. So where could I go with that? There's nowhere to go. Um, and this is creates that option. So, so I feel like they could coexist in, in, in a pretty friendly way. So I'm curious in Maven, you said there's no formal upvoting process, but does the do, can ideas themselves, or let's say posts, which you know mimetically embody an idea, let's say, can they themselves, even if even just temporarily, dominate the platform because they're just so good and people are so engaged and interested in the idea that the idea itself it starts to expand its exposure or the algorithm expands exposure of that idea. So it's like truly meritocratic yeah, or does every, yeah. does everything fizzle out because it just always makes room for more. Yeah. We've put a lot of thought into this um, because, you know, by the way, you could think of uh, current social networks as meritocratic as well, you know, because you could think that the people who have the most followers deserve the most followers, the posts to get the most likes deserve the most likes. It's like pure meritocracy. But the problem is that objective things can be deceptive, you know? So it's not always the case that as you maximize some quantity, things actually get better. And sometimes things actually get worse in some sense. It's, that's called deception. Um, this is something that comes up in AI too, that there's deception, this happens, it's like your premature convergence, like you, 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 you move in a direction that seems like things are getting better, but it actually hit a brick wall and you've been deceived. It's like a false compass. And so the so it, like while there's a very meritocratic interpretation of current social media, you have to understand that meritocracy has limits in complex spaces. Um, like in the sense that like some ideas are really subjective. Um, most ideas that are creative are subjective at first, even scientific ones, because they haven't been proven yet. They're just, in, there's just intuitions. Those ideas, when they're shared, cannot really be ranked effectively. Um, because think about it, like the most popular things tend to be the things that are most accepted in the current dogma. Um, and so fringe things naturally would have less support because they're considered to be fringe. But it's always fringe things that lead to like new playground. Because those are like the new, if, if it wasn't a fringe thing, then it would already be recognized and everybody would agree that it's important. So like we can't have effective exploration in what you would call like pure meritocracy. And so there's the, the real question here is not meritocracy versus not meritocracy. It's balancing act. Like we have to balance the idea that some things, we, we should look at the degree to which things deserve to be heard, but we can't put too much stock in deceptive objective metrics, which then lead us to these extremes, which are why we have so much toxicity and brand building. And stuff, it's because like that's what wins in this so-called meritocracy, but it's actually not as what is the highest value to the consumer. Um, and so what our system is going to do is strike the balance. So it will have a marriage credit aspect. But it's way less like dedicated to this ridiculous, like extreme objective assumption that everything needs to be maximized for anything to deserve to do anything. And so to do that, it's striking this balance in a couple ways. So it's a little bit subtle, but of course it has to be subtle because we're talking about balance and balance is always a subtle thing. So one thing is that what we do is we do treat conversations as first class citizens. So like if there's people been talking about something and some new thing has been entered into that conversation, that's a first class citizen. Like something like X conversations basically die after a day. Our conversations just go on forever. So like if something was from a month ago, somebody adds to it that comes back in and people can see that and that's surfaced to them. And so conversations that are highly active as a side effect will be surfaced over and over and over again. Yeah, so this yeah, yeah. To continue to be active. There's one other subtle thing that we're doing, which is called uh, a minimal criterion, but that's kind of like an AI jargony term. It basically means that instead of maximization as an alternative, we say that things should be better than a minimum and then we just leave it alone. So like we are not for total crap. Like total crap is generally not good for anybody. And you could think of meritocracy as interested in not being exposed to crap. Um, but above a certain threshold, it's not helpful anymore. You see this phenomenon in all kinds of aspects of life that like after you hit a certain threshold, it's very subjective and, and rating things stops working really well. Um, because it becomes idiosyncratic and personal, like whether something resonates with an individual and it no longer matters anymore. But you also see it in things like like IQ, like if somebody with like a 140 IQ versus a 150 IQ, it's like totally unpredictable, like what's going to happen. 
Um, and like, so it like, it starts to be ridiculous, but like, obviously, like if you're talking about like extremely low IQs, like there is some threshold under which like you have a serious problem and it's like not debatable. It's a problem. Um, and so it's like high end stuff though. Let that stuff just organically move around without pretending that we can be objective about it. And you can see this in like, like one, I was looking at a thread on Maven, um, like a couple of weeks ago where people were asked, like, what's some like really interesting piece of wisdom that you've absorbed in, 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 in really succinct terms. And like people just threw in all these kind of things that they thought were interesting stuff they'd learned over their life. And it just occurred to me how ridiculous it would be to rate all of that. It's like, it's so subjective and imagine, like I just was absorbing each one in its own right. Like I was looking through each piece of wisdom. They're all interesting. And just thinking about them independently. But imagine the experience on another network where they would be ranked because everything is a Darwinian competition, so-called meritocratic. So there would be a best piece of wisdom and a second best. And then the rich get richer phenomenon would kick in. So the best piece of wisdom would get even bigger votes. And so you would come in immediately with a preconceived notion that this is the most important piece of wisdom and the other ones suck. <laughs> even though you haven't had a chance to be to be individually, uh, to individually allow yourself to just contemplate it for yourself, which means a lot to you for yourself. Like you're being stopped from having that kind of thinking where you deserve to think for yourself. You shouldn't have a thousand people voting for what matters to you. It means a lot to you where you are in your life. That is a crazy situation that every single piece of content goes through that faux meritocratic filter. Um, and so we're being careful about this. We're saying, well, we won't expose you to, to total garbage. But above a threshold, we're going to just let things just float freely um, and we'll get to see everything. So so let me ask this. Um, <clears throat> let's let's hypo uh, hypothesize a post that would be incredibly popular, but incredibly low value. For example, Selena Gomez in a bathing suit, standing on a pretty beach, holding a tropical drink, hashtag best life. Right, right, right. No, no other yeah. no other caption that would literally blow up like. Yeah. 74 million likes on, but like totally yeah. superficial, no substance, no, yeah, nothing yeah, redeeming yeah. for anyone. How would yeah. your system handle that post? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's a great example because, yeah, it would be so different that it's just actually just intriguing to think about what happens there because right. like immediately it runs into this completely different world where it can't blow up, right? There's no, there's no likes. So how will it go out? So first you have to ask who would post that because what is the incentive to do it? Like it right. won't help you build up anything. So I would expect just on the face of it to see less of it just because it doesn't fit with the incentive system anymore. But if you did post something like that, okay, what will happen? First of all, like if people aren't interested in the topic, they won't get exposed to it anyway um, because this is an interest-based system. So people follow interests. And so there's an AI trying to figure out, would you be interested in this? So most people wouldn't even see it because they're not interested and it's, in whatever the heck. And it's using and it's it's analyzing images and videos, not just text, right? Analyzing images and videos and well, actually, right now it's just text. I mean, we'll we'll get to images and videos. Okay. I mean, if it was just an image, though, it would it would be um, it would. I mean, it wouldn't go anywhere because like it, it wouldn't be intersecting with any interest. So you have to post some text with it. Okay. Um, and it actually doesn't. If it's too trivial of text, it won't. Uh, it won't um, actually uh, surface it. So it, it doesn't compute an interest if you just write best life or something. Like there's no right. interest that could be there. Um, but if, so you can imagine someone's trying to be sneaky and trollish. Like, so they, they put that picture because the picture is attractive. And then they put something longer that's kind of like made up garbage, gobbledygook, just to, so that somebody will see it. So you could cause somebody to see it. Um, and then like those people would be, they can't like it though. There's no likes. So, so like the only real option to to cause it to proliferate would be to reply. Um, but mm -hmm. what would you say? There's no discussion here. Um, I mean, to the extent that somebody would like to discuss that topic, I mean, you can call it a topic. Like, I don't know what this is about. It's just some girl at a beach, but like you could say, let's, let's discuss this topic. And people could, like they could discuss it, but it'll, it'll, it'll turn into a very narrow niche discussion because I mean, most people don't want to discuss. So it, there's nothing really to discuss. It could, so let's say hypothetically, if it turned into a, a conversation around uh, mm -hmm. pop culture, mm-hmm. And that, yeah, that that could, could that could become the unintended idea of yeah, that picture. That's and it true. Could that could happen. happen. Yeah, it could morph. And I mean, like our, yeah. our algorithm is set to our algorithm is set to track how conversations um, 
you know, we wind in a circuitous way. So it doesn't always just look at the initial topic. It looks at how they're evolving over time to figure out whether it's interesting to people. And so, yeah, if it, if it sort of evolved into a critique of social, co so, social commentary, then, then yeah, that would, that would, that might hit more people uh, that have that interest, but it'll never blow up virally. It just, there is no such concept. We don't have viral. So fundamentally, is it is it fair is it a fair synopsis to say Maven is attempting to create a social media experience for people that is far more interesting and far less prone to toxicity or addiction? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's a good way to say it. Um, it's uh, you know, like we've said, look, like you, you follow your interests, not influencers. Uh, so so you're going for interests, and yeah. So it's gonna so yeah. it's gonna not it's gonna natively appeal to people that are interested in being interested yes and that, you know what i mean question. and that is yeah, and that yeah, goes back yeah. to our opening conversation not everybody's interested in being interested yeah 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 agreed i mean that's that's the big question is how many people are interested in being interested like what is that enough to yeah you know keep, keep you active and stimulated to to just be pursuing interest it takes a little a little energy and active participation i think more maybe more than kind of the passive consumption <laughs> Um, so we and, should, and we should, things. we yeah. should, we should force everyone on earth to use Maven for six months. And then at that point they can choose to leave. And then everybody that leaves go, wants to go back to TikTok and go back to TikTok. And then we take everybody that's still on Maven and do a deal with Elon, get us all to Mars and build a new civilization only with people that are interested in being interested and see what happens. I probably would sign up for that experiment. But anyways, I digress. That sounds like a, a good business plan. <laughs> I'd love to know <laughs> oh, if we could do that. So, yeah. okay. So uh, in, in the interest of, of time, um, I swear this is such a, this has been such a meta conversation because it's we're talking about how to algorithmically analyze how conversations meander and, you know, introduce and remove, add and subtract themes and circle back on themselves. Yeah. And anyway, and here we are demonstrating it. But um, let, let's maybe try to bring this home. And say, sure. based on, like, I, I, you can probably feel how aligned I am with your premise. Like this concept of like awakening people to divergent thinking and and divergent framing of thought and ideas themselves to ultimately lead to creativity and progress. Like, I'm that's yeah. super aligned there. How do we how do we connect that back for, let's say, the average? listener and I don't, I don't love the term average because it has a negative connotation but sort of the the median listener across all demographic and psychographic you know categories of of whoever's listening to this yeah. how can somebody take these concepts and go apply them to their life right now yeah. to make things better for themselves and yeah. others yeah yeah so the answer to that is that the first thing to recognize is that it's actually okay and justified to pursue something because you're interested in it, even if you don't know where it leads, which means you can have no objective. Um, you can just say, I just feel like this is what I want to do. Now, I think it's important to think about why you feel that way, but that's different than knowing where it goes. In other words, like you can talk about why something is interesting, and that's something we're all afraid of because it's subjective. For some reason, we've been taught that being subjective is a bad thing, especially like scientists. It's like, oh no, you can't raise, it's not an objective concept. But, but the truth is like subjectivity is what humans are actually good at. It's easy to look at a graph and see that like the performance is going up over time. Like anybody can do that. You can be in sixth grade and do that. Um, what is hard is to actually analyze things from an intuitive perspective and have a gut instinct about something. But that's actually what humans are good at. But it tends to be that we're good at it in areas that we're familiar with. So of course, like if you wanted to have really interesting perspectives on what to pursue next in the field of artificial intelligence, you wouldn't go just poll people walking down the street. Like their interests aren't that useful in that regard because the average person doesn't have any exposure to like the underlying intellectual issues in the artificial intelligence. But if you talk to uh, like people who are in the field, like professionals, yeah, of course their instincts and intuitions matter. And so intuitions tell you things like that this would be really interesting to create this experiment, even though I don't actually know how how the, the outcome will be or what it will actually teach us yet. But I do know it'll open up a new playground. And so applying this to your personal or professional life, you know, you can do things even when you only know that you're interested in it. And this is actually a profound thing, you know, because the thing is that people are really scared 
of things that don't have an objective justification because they think they have to have one, which is why you feel like you're in a straitjacket all the time. Because you have all kinds of things you'd like to do, which is called freedom, to be able to do the things you want, but you don't have objective justification, so you're locked in jail, in effect, because you can't do them. Because yeah. you, you believe, you bought into this idea, there needs to be objective justification. So everything is ruled out, all these things you'd be doing. If you were a child in a playground, you would do whatever the hell you wanted. You wouldn't be blocked by these things. Um, but because of the... Sorry, sorry about that. So, yeah, because of the fact that you have these 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 objective assumptions, you wouldn't be able to actually allow yourself to explore. Um, and I've met people all over the place um, who are suffering from this, you know, because of my book, and 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 saw that, you know, like one of the biggest things that affected me was when I spoke to a bunch of artists. Like I went to the Rhode Island School of Design and talked to artists, and I saw people almost on the verge of tears explaining to me. Um, in private sessions that I had after my talk, they were explaining to me that I haven't been able to justify my career choice to my parents or to my teachers. I haven't been able to justify why I'm making the things I'm making. Like, what use does this have for the whole world? Like, why are you doing these pointless things? Pointless means there's no objective. And for the first time, like, hearing all of this has made me realize, like, I actually might be okay to do this. Because the truth is, the most interesting things you could possibly do are the ones that don't have an objective. It's just that they're also risky. So that I just have to add that caveat at the end. You have to recognize that I'm not telling you that there's some guarantee in the world that if you do what you find interesting, you're going to be successful. You might not be. You're taking a calculated risk. So if you're not willing to take risks, then don't do this. Then then stay in the objective straitjacket because it's safer. And you'll do something modest. But if you want to do something great, which is why the book is called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, this is the only way. It's the only way you'll get to greatness. So you have to be able to take some risks. Yeah, and 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 I will I will say I I have a pretty deeply entrenched belief that the life that we are designed for on this earth is a life of greatness, and in and in the modern world is a life that requires ambitious thinking, which I think probably is operationalized in the way that you're describing, not in the way that. that society tells us, you know, oh, well, check these boxes, you know, medical, they say, oh, well, if you want that life, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer. But even now you look at those average outcomes and they're, and they're, you know, 90, 94% of doctors in a study said, I would not, I would not tell my children to become doctors because the medical system is so miserable to operate in now. And so, and I'm actually, I'm going to use an example from my life that I think illustrates this really well. Again, this has all been meta, this podcast itself is the least justifiable and defensible investment that my overall business uh, endeavors makes in terms mm -hmm. of investing in something that takes my time. And frankly, the investment in this podcast, the the highest cost investment in this podcast is the time I spend doing it in yeah. terms of the, what I can generate doing other things for the business. And I have the number of times that I have had to, I have had to tell people no, we're not get we're not getting rid of the podcast. It's not on the table, because frankly, yeah. it make it makes so much else of what I have to do just enjoyable that I have this yeah. outlet in my life. But also, yeah. I look at relationships and, and conversations like with yourself. I referenced Ian McGilchrist. I, yeah. I would think of like some conversations I've had with you know some brilliantly smart people, John Demartini, Kevin Kelly, and 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 hundreds of these conversations that inform the way I run the business. Yeah. Even though the business itself is is somewhat averse to the process that I go through because it is unplanned and unplannable by its nature because yeah. it's open-ended human dialogue with yeah. somewhat, yeah. quote, random people, that is yeah. why our platform has evolved to be so different in its space. And so it's like yeah. you can feel the machine trying to cut off its own creative fuel supply because it can't process, it can't objectify it. And yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and so I have to be this stand for that which makes us great so that we don't destroy ourselves. And the only reason I'm able to do that is because I'm not just the CEO, I'm also the owner. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. And, yeah, that makes sense. And this is why yeah. this is why people have got to get into an ownership position in their life, because mm -hmm. otherwise all the institutions that you're associated with will squeeze this part of your life out because it cannot understand it. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. It's all good points. I mean, it's, it's paradoxical. Yeah. How like this very useful I mean, 
uh, you know, thing that you do for, for your business, like having this podcast has like, is like the most difficult thing to justify objectively. Um, like that's yeah. sometimes they call this objective paradox, but you, you know, it's, it's just, um, and it's a paradoxical that having an objective actually can prevent you from doing things like this. Um, because if you strictly only can objectively justify the things that you do as a business, then you can't do this because it's not objectively justifiable. And I, I've run into people over and over again, like saying things like this, who run, we're, we're in high level positions in businesses. It's like they were just, you know, just really fatigued by like the, the desire sometimes to do things because they just made sense to do, but they're not objectively justified and they just can't convince people that that's sufficiently justified in order to get that off the ground. Um, and these would be like people who kind of were related to what you said, we're, we're in very high positions of authority and still struggled. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's the ownership problem. Yeah. Cause they couldn't really, even at being like at the CEO level, there's like, they're still answering to the investors. And so now they're scared. Um, but you know, like part of the reason that, I wrote the book was I thought that um, like this could be kind of a weapon that you could use to argue with whoever those people are above you because almost everybody has somebody above them unless you totally own things, which you do, which is a nice position. Um, but like, I mean, I was thinking people should, you might need to convince those people. Um, like if you're, it, it, even if you're at a high level, like there's still somebody you talk answer to and, and, and they aren't going to just automatically understand what you're talking about. Like you can't just go to someone like a high, high level figure and be like, well, you know, we should just do this because it's interesting. And like, just thank you. Now let me go do my thing. Um, it's like, they don't understand. And so I, I, I thought maybe we should put some arguments out there um, to help people to make those arguments in order to do things like this more. Yeah, I love that. No, I appreciate it. I feel like you've you've written, I need again, I need to read the book, but from what I understand of it, it's, it's almost like a, a philosophical tract for what I'm trying to enroll people in all the time, which is is to let go a little bit. Yeah. And see and see what happens in your life because I promise most of your goals fit into the category of things that there is no currently obvious existing plan to lead to. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, people in hindsight talk like this all the time. You know, it's it's like I never realized that like when I met this person that, that they would become my mentor and change my life, or like the class that I like didn't want to take turned out to be the one that really mattered the most to me. And it's just like there's story after story. It's like the biggest inflection points in life are often the ones that weren't planned out. Would I asked I asked how you would apply this way of thinking to to the, the practical reality of a human life? Would one of the uh, applications be to simply just try more things? You think? Yeah, I mean, I would I would say that, that that's a good that that's a good uh, lesson to draw. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty simple lesson, but you can do that. You can try more things, be more willing to try. But I, but I say like try them if you think they're interesting to you. Obviously, hmm. and just do. I don't wouldn't feel like you're pressured. Like you have to try more things because try more things is on the agenda. It's just try things that are interesting to you. Like those are the things you'll be good at. Those are the the exploratory playgrounds that you'll actually exploit. Like other people wouldn't be as good at that playground as you, but the reason is because you're actually interested in it. So you'll exploit it. You'll find all the little interesting corners there and you'll go even farther and you don't know where you're going to end up. Um, but it's worth finding out. You should really not leave those interesting possibilities un unturned that are in your own life because that's where you'll actually do interesting things. Yeah. I had a guy on the show a couple of weeks ago, Dan Ariely, uh, who has a book called Predictably Irrational. I actually think you might be interested in that. He's a behavioral economist, but it's all about the irrationality that accretes upward into the economic reality, the rationality of human behavior. And, uh, but that was his sort of central point was like, people just try more things because all of this attempt, a, attempting to predict outcomes, uh, you you end up missing the magic. So anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that actually, yeah. there's one thing on that just to mention. Like it, one thing I talk about in the book and, and even in, in AI is, is this idea of what I called stepping stone collection. Actually, that's another good piece of advice for mm. people like, that like like one of the, when I'm saying like what are you actually doing like when you're following this philosophy is is stepping stone collection. It's the idea that like the reason you're doing things is not because you're getting closer to where you need to be because that would mean you have an objective, but rather it's because you're expanding your collection of stepping stones. And the more stepping stones you have, the more places you can get. So then, if your next question is, "But where am I trying to get?" then you, you don't understand because I'm saying you're not trying to get anywhere. You're just trying to expand your collection, but it becomes a more and more powerful collection the bigger it gets. And so the more places you can go, and those are those trying things. That's basically what you're saying. It's like the yeah. things that the, the ability to the trying more things just leads to more stepping stones. 
And then those things lead to more things. And that sort of like serendipity surface is increasing. So like the, the opportunity for having an accidental discovery is going way, way up because you're collecting stepping stones. Oh, I love it. I, f I literally could, could have this conversation all day. There's just so much gold here uh, because, I mean, fundamentally, we're talking about the, the implicit collective agreements that we have made as a society about how the world works and how we should work within it. And if those are not sound, we're, we're headed to some pretty questionable places. And I, I, I feel like this conversation yeah. is really questioning some of those foundations. Super cool, man. Yeah, Thank you yeah, so yeah. much. Uh, I, I wish we didn't have to wrap, but thank you so much for being a guest on the show, Kenneth. This has been incredible. Thank you. It was a great show. Thanks for um, having me on. And, and hey, as a, as a, as a, a final note, uh, you mentioned try.heymaven.com. Uh, is there any any other play? Uh, we obviously talked about your book, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, which for, I'm for 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 any book that I haven't actually read, I'm probably more willing to say people should read it than any other book because I just love what it's about. Um, but also, anything else you'd like to to send people toward? If people just want to see generally things I've been doing or done, uh, they could go to kenstanley.net. Um, that's just my name dot net, um, and. Uh, yeah, that there's links to different stuff from me. Um, and so you could see all the stuff, publications from my scientific career, uh, videos, things like that. Awesome. Super interesting stuff. I have no doubt. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Stanley, for being a guest on the show. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And to all you viewers and listeners out there, you are the best part of this show. You're why I do it every single time. I'm so glad we got this time together. Can't wait till the next one. Take care. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. Don't buy this story that you haven't got any free will. You have, you're not a machine, you're not predestined. This is the way in which we now think, oh, we're all just cogs in a machine, but we are not.